and thank you for joining me for this new edition of Business Africa. On our show today, we follow the creativity of African entrepreneurs in solving the sub-region's daily financial problems. And we talk about Africa's energy dilemma with NG Ayuk, Executive Chairman of the African Energy Chamber. But first, let's get on with the show with our top stories today. Is it the end of coin shortage? In Cameroon, the Kori application allows you to recover your change on your phone. Thanks to the Kori app, you can collect change digitally rather than physically. Your money is given back to you on the application in a small digital wallet, and you can use this change in any of the shops that gave it to you. Around 100 new startups created thanks to the Ghana Innovation Hub, a fast-growing ecosystem in the country. Here in the Ghana Innovation Hub, we have a shelf where we showcase the products of our entrepreneurs. So all these products you see here are samples of what they do and in a way of helping them, we advertise it for them. Less watering, less pests and more fresh fruits and vegetables. That's the promise of greenhouse cultivation in Somalia. Some vegetables were from Nairobi, but they are available now in Mogadishu. In our country, we can get the best fresh products that last for a very long time. What to do when money runs out? If you live in Central Africa, you have undoubtedly noticed that coins have become rare in recent years. Coins that usually allow you to pay for your purchases and, above all, to recover change money from your banknotes. This phenomenon is literally suffocating several economies in the region. In some countries, such as Cameroon, it has become increasingly difficult for merchants and users to have access to coins, which are essential for daily shopping and small transactions. A young Cameroonian entrepreneur has just turned this obstacle into an opportunity by creating the Kori app an application allowing consumers to retrieve their change on their mobile phones. Our correspondent in Douala, Maxim Fahal Bunya, explains. The divisional currency crisis continues to persist in Central Africa, particularly Cameroon, despite the massive injection of coins printed by the French Central Bank and the French printing house, Auberture Fiduciaire. Ultimately, this injection failed to fill the gap or replenish the money circuit, which was strongly hit by scarcity. Retailers, large-scale distributors, grocers, and other traditional users of coins remain desperate. We contacted an economist based in Douala, Cameroon, to find out why. According to Devaris, Gunju, the demographic explosion is one of the leading causes of the shortage. In reality, we are moving to a population of 30 million inhabitants with a money supply for only 15 million people. This means that during this period of time, economic operators and small traders have increased too, while the money supply has not increased as significantly. This is one of the main reasons. The second is the network set up over the last few years to absorb coins and manufacture high-value objects. It turned out that there were networks in place, notably Asian Chinese ones. To take part, some Cameroonians are said to have set up gaming rooms to recover coins for trafficking in China. You know, a 25 franc coin transformed into jewelry will no longer sell for the same price or for tens of thousands of CFA francs. When the Chinese discovered this in Central Africa, particularly Cameroon, they thought it was a windfall. When you apprehend them, for example, with a hundred million of small coins transformed into silver ingots, it's then practically worth billions. These illegal activities are not without consequences for the economic players of the Central African sub-region. Our economy on the African continent, particularly in the Africa sub-region, well, a large part of it is strictly informal. If you want to buy something, are you short 10 francs to pay it back in a CMAC zone with 60 million people? Well, if there are 30 million people who miss a transaction of 10 francs, that's at least 90 billion CFE francs lost per month. 
per year. That's more than 1,080 billion for 10 francs alone. And if you take 100 francs more than 100,000 billion in lost turnover. The solution to remedy this is to create a digital currency. This is exactly what a Cameroonian entrepreneur has created with her application known as Cori. Founded in 2022 by Magali Go Sanga, the Cori app enables users to create digital loyalty cards on which the startup's partner merchants can pay cash back and any outstanding payment. It is quite simple. Thanks to the Curie app, you can collect change digitally rather than physically. Your money is given back to you on the application in a small digital wallet, and you can use this change in any of the shops that gave it to you. For every purchase you make in Corey's partner shops, regardless of the method you use to make the payment, you will receive part of the amount you spend back on your loyalty card. This is to reward you for your loyalty, for the fact that you have come to this store rather than another. You will be reimbursed part of the amount spent. So the more you spend in a partner store, the more money you will get back that you can use to buy what you want in the same shop. But in practical terms, how does the Cori application work when it comes to making purchases? The change deposited in the application is first and foremost the change left at the cash desk, so there is a parallel between the change left by the customer and the change credited to your card. For example, you make a purchase of 700 francs and pay with a 1,000 francs note. The 300 francs you leave at the till are credited to your loyalty card. So you and the merchant have very clear visibility in real time of the money left at the shop because you see it on your card as soon as you leave the shop. And so, for example, you have consumers in the supermarket who do their shopping and can now buy extra packs of water, extra sugar, extra flour and extra meat. So we're helping to have a positive impact on the local and regional economy. Corey is already very popular and fancied by users in shops and supermarkets partnering with the application. Once in the shop, I use my trolley and pick up what I want. Then I go to the checkout. Once I'm there, I pay in cash. After the payment, they give me the ticket, which I scan, and it goes directly to my Cori account which multiplies the cash in my account. That's how it works. Thanks to Cori app, users have already been refunded more than 7 million CFA francs in digital currency when shopping in partner supermarkets in French-speaking Africa. Economists such as Devaris Gunju, who approve this kind of product, also suggest another solution to the coin shortage, the offer to manufacture smaller denominations of banknotes, in particular 50s and 100 francs, to discourage coin smuggling networks. What consequences can we expect from the decision of free West African nations to leave the ECOWAS community? One thing is sure, the joint announcement 10 days ago by Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso to leave their economic organization of 15 member states has reignited tensions and opened a chapter of uncertainty. Members of the 15-member ECOWAS bloc benefit from free movement of people, goods and capital and a common market. Eight countries, including the free withdrawing nations, are also members of the West African Monetary Union with a common currency. And on the other side of the continent, Zimbabwe is facing serious monetary difficulties. The Zimbabwean dollar reintroduced in 2019 is in free fall against the US dollar. It currently takes 100 notes of the highest denomination of the Zimbabwean dollar to buy a loaf of bread. The strongest denomination being 100 Zimbabwean dollars worth less than a US cent. Just like in 2008, galloping inflation has developed and the value of the local currency continues to weaken. Meanwhile, the US dollar now represents 80% of the transactions in the country. 
After Zimbabwe, we head for Ghana, where still many entrepreneurs lack the skills required to run a business and operate in a competitive environment. And it's usually due to lack of access to capital and technology. To overcome this, Ghana's government is focusing on startup incubators, and they're very popular with entrepreneurs. Our journalists George Ibo Saki and John Awotwi visited one of them, the Ghana Innovation Hub. Take a look. With the establishment of the new support services firm, the Ghana Innovation Hub, Ghana's authorities are helping entrepreneurs like Folasade Rufai of Dawa Foods make their businesses more competitive, not just in the local market, but internationally too. At the time when I applied for the program, I did not have any um, properly structured um, financial management in place for my business. And um, as I speak now, um, I have been assisted through the program to have um, a better uh, bookkeeping and financial uh, management structure for my business. I've also been able to meet um, friends here who have introduced me to people who can stock my product. The Ghana Innovation Hub was established by Ghana's Ministry of Communication with funding from the World Bank. Since its creation in 2019, the center has engaged with over 2,000 youth groups with entrepreneurship training program. As a result, about 90 new companies are being trained or are at various stages of development. We have three main partners in the implementation. So I myself work for MDF West Africa, but we uh, also partner with, uh, with GCTU and Blue Space Africa. So it's a consortium of three organizations that's managing this space and also running the programs here. The companies enjoying GIH's support vary from agro-processing, packaging, to technology-based industries and firms offering innovative solutions. The center provides workspaces for businesses, conference rooms for training, and workshops and meeting rooms for planning, networking, and engagement. The hub also has space to showcase the products of trainees for marketing and promotional purposes. Here in the Ghana Innovation Hub, we have a shelf where we showcase the products of our entrepreneurs. So all these products you see here are samples of what they do. And in a way of helping them, we advertise it for them. When someone walks in, they can get their contacts from here then call them to make their purchases. Centers like the Ghana Innovation Hub are essential to reducing youth unemployment in Ghana by teaching young entrepreneurs and innovators to navigate the business world through skills development and resource assistance. The Innovation Hub is helping youth to economically support themselves through entrepreneurship and business development while reducing the pressure on the government to provide public sector jobs for its youth. Two companies that were in that first cohort, one is processing egg into dried egg powder, which is used for pharmaceuticals, and they've now grown to a stage where they're also doing other products and other poultry products, and they are now in the Orange Corners acceleration program. So they have grown their business to a level that they need support in formalizing their financing, uh, their financial management, but also their sales and distribution. Um, so that is one example. Um, another example is Tropical Growers, who is also it was in that same cohort of Innovate GH. They are doing lettuce and herbs with aquaponics. So hydroponics, it's a water-based growing system. You don't need soil. With the appropriate level of investment and resources from the government and other development partners, the center has the potential to give many more young entrepreneurs the needed assistance to bring their innovative ideas and visions to contribute towards Ghana's industrialization drive.
Welcome back to the second part of our show. We now turn to the issue of access to electricity, which remains at the forefront of daily concerns in Africa. A report by the International Energy Agency has just flagged a persistent situation of power outages and load shedding in several countries on the continent last year. These mainly include Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa, Madagascar and Kenya, where a nearly 24-hour blackout affected around 50 million people last August. To discuss these challenges, but also the continent's prospects, we spoke in Joburg with Angie Ayuk, the president of the African Energy Chamber. Listen to him. Angie Ayuk, what do you think as measures the national administration should take now to deal with this persisting low level of electricity access in Africa? We need to take immediate action on this crisis. The climate crisis and energy poverty need to be addressed both. They're two sides of the same coin. So every country right now in Africa has to prioritize providing energy access, electricity. But let me step back and let's look at Africa as a whole. 600 million Africans don't have access to electricity. 900 million don't have access to clean cooking technologies, most of them women. That is no longer a luxury issue, it's a human rights issue. But then we cannot wait for someone to do it for us. We need to include that in the budget and cut some waste and really drive up even gas to power projects and drive up other kind of projects to really provide energy access because you know what? When we t tackle this energy problem, it increases jobs, it increases growth because manufacturing and everything that needs that baseload energy that needs to happen. African nations need to ramp up budgets. They need to ramp up financing for energy access projects immediately because it's a crisis that needs immediate attention right now in the continent. There is a paradox. The continent produces a lot of oil. Still, there are often queues and shortages at petrol stations, and fuel is expensive all over the continent. How do you explain this outcome, and what can be done? We never built refineries in the continent. We never looked at refined products. Oil was produced in Africa for Western markets. We did not see Africa as a market. And when we, had, when we had a market, we had governments controlling everything and regulating too much, so the private sector didn't have a chance to walk right in. This, is, this has changed though. We even had a moment where we would send crude oil from Africa to Europe to be refined, then brought back in Africa. So we were paying high prices at the pump beyond market rates because we needed these products to live our daily lives. Now we've seen big, massive projects, the single largest project and refinery that has been built in Africa and across the world with new technology, the Dan Cote refinery that is going to be doing a lot, about 650,000 barrels we could process a day. There is, there is still, there is hope, but we need to build more. In East Africa, there are challenges. In West Africa, there's still challenges. But also there's going to be challenges to get crude into, that, into, into those refineries. That's why we need to ramp up production to take care of African energy security, but we need to do it in a sustainable way. Because when you do it in a sustainable way, we become good stewards of the environment too, and we also meet our climate challenge as we've been required, because it's, it's called global warming, not Africa warming. So you need a global solution, and Africa is part of this solution in order to make, encourage that. But we need to also encourage local refining capacity rather than us waiting for European refiners to refine products, to do refined products and bring it into Africa. You advocate that even if Africa supports global efforts toward energy transition, natural gas should remain in the mix. How to combine energy transition and renewable energy on the one hand and economic development with the potential of Africa's gas reserves on the other? It's very easy. Natural gas is the cleanest fossil fuel out there. But then also pay attention to this. If you produce all of Africa's natural gas. Africa's greenhouse gas emissions are 2.73% compared to um, when you look at the global climate atlas. You, Africa's greenhouse gas emission would increase by 0.67%, not even up to 1% if you produce all Africa's natural gas. But natural gas affords Africa the base load um, energy that it would need to drive up power. But it's not just about power. 
It's about also looking at petrochemicals. We'll be able to produce manufacturing through by using our own fertilizer, urea, ammonia, NPK, fertilizer plants, and we'll be able to produce food. So we don't have to deal with go to Russia and Ukraine to beg for food. And you want to tell poor people in Africa with no access, with nothing, that they shouldn't use cheap, affordable, baseload energy to grow their lives? I think there is a whole lot of disconnect. The EU, the European Union, says natural gas is green energy, the same as, as renewables. Why is it green energy for Europe and it's not green energy for poor people in Africa? I think that's unfair. Nuclear energy is a direction that some countries, such as Burkina Faso, are considering to take now. Is nuclear energy an option for Africa as a whole? It is an option, but also you have to deal with the huge capital expenditures. We need to figure out how to finance that. And if you're able to finance that, then it works. But also, there's also an alternative which you can go with using SMRs, small, um, um, small modular reactors, to really be able to drive and drive and get long-term projects going with nuclear. That's something that African states should really consider because we have to have all of the above energy solutions, given where we are right now. We're in a crisis. We're in a crisis. So when you're in a crisis, you use what you have to get what you want. All of their both energy solutions and nuclear offers hope for Africa. NG Ayuk, thank you very much. Thank you so much, it's an honor. We were talking here with NG Ayuk, the president of the African Energy Chamber in Joburg. The Democratic Republic of Congo has successfully restructured a 2008 deal over the Sikamines copper and cobalt mine. The country is expected to receive $7 billion in funding in this revamped minerals for infrastructure contract with China. The new agreement will give the DRC public company Gekka Mines a 1.2% royalty from the revenues of the mine as well as the right to market 32% of its output. And children in Cameroon were the first in the world to receive the malaria immunization vaccine. The country has adopted the vaccine recommended by the WHO, the World Health Organization. Across the continent, about 19 other nations will gradually introduce the vaccine, which is expected to benefit 3 million children. Malaria still kills 600,000 people per year, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. Droughts, torrential rains, ancient farming practices with low productivity and even invasions of locusts. It has never been more difficult to cultivate crops in the Horn of Africa. This is, for example, the reality of millions of subsistence farmers threatened with famine in Somalia. But a new generation has decided to take up the challenge. Armed with all the basic knowledge, but also some new techniques through videos gleaned from the internet, these young farmers have decided to turn to greenhouse cultivation. Less water needs, less harmful insects, greenhouses have become a guarantee of supply of fresh produce. Take a look. Food security in Somalia is an everlasting problem with millions facing starvation every year. It's mainly due to the erratic weather patterns characterized by heavy floods and severe droughts, but also rudimentary agricultural practices. The outbreak of COVID-19 and locust invasion further compounded an already fragile situation. Amid this escalating situation, young Somalis are now shifting to greenhouse farming to not only boost food production, but also earn a living. I invested in energy and started this project in the countryside to enable my people to take advantage of the greenhouse. The technology has allowed me to plant some vegetables that used to be brought from abroad. With a seed capital of $10,000 from his family, Sabrie started off the greenhouse farm in the outskirts of Somali's capital, Mogadishu. He had studied greenhouse farming at the Somali National University. But he says he got more practical knowledge on YouTube and Google. He is among the increasing number of farmers who are embracing this modern and high-yielding technology. His farm 
generates an average of 100,000 kilograms of an assortment of vegetables every six months. At the farm, one of the workers, Mohammed Omar, is spraying the vegetables to rid them of insects and disease. The pesticides and sprayers have to be imported from neighboring countries such as Kenya, since they are not readily available in Somalia. Some of the crops on his farm include bell peppers, tomatoes and cucumbers. Well, the greenhouse will be a better option for us in the future because out in an open field there's problems like insects. But the greenhouse is safer and it could help get better crops. For traders, the greenhouse technologies now ensure fresh and quality produce arriving in the market on time. This is a revolution from the past when most of the fresh vegetables were imported from neighboring Kenya and Ethiopia. A kilogram of tomatoes is sold at $1.2 like imported ones. The local produce sells fast since they are fresh and undamaged. Some vegetables were from Nairobi, but they are available now in Mogadishu. In our country, we can get the best fresh products that last for a very long time. Even the plum tomatoes have become local, and we can get them in our country, clean and undamaged vegetables, also without soil. These vegetables are available from the greenhouse in the country. Tomatoes used to be brought from Ethiopia over land and would be quite damaged by the time we got them. But now we get it fresh. From Kenya, it was expensive cargo and arrived at the airport also damaged. Now we don't have to face this problem. It is grown in the countryside and you can order and get it right away. Agricultural experts now see the greenhouse technology as one of the most viable options in boosting food production in Somali, especially in light of adverse climatic conditions. The field is important for everyone and especially for the farmers who can produce vegetables each season. Uh, we have seen in our country, especially in the capital, that tomato production has stopped temporarily, which caused a price hike and poor people couldn't afford to buy it. The idea of a greenhouse is better and it can produce more. With over half of the population facing dire food shortages every year, Somalia is among the most food insecure countries in the world. However, initiatives such as greenhouse technologies can go a long way in alleviating perennial food shortages in the country. Well, that's it for today. Business Africa is over. I'll see you next week, same time, same channel for Initiative Africa. We'll host Eric Golf Kwachu, chairman of the Union of Cameroonians Abroad. In the meantime, you can catch this show again on our website, africanair.com, and follow us on all our social media channels. Feel free to share, like, and comment using the hashtag Business Africa. Have a great week, and until next time, goodbye. Thank <music> you.